Um, our final speaker in the session uh, today is uh, Daniel Sekela, uh, who's going to tell us about rewriting structured co-spans. Let me go ahead and share. Okay. Uh, let me throw that in the presentation. So just a reminder for anybody who may be joining us, if you have questions, um, you can hang on to them until the end when we'll have a few minutes, or if they're quick and urgent, you can uh, type them in the chat and other people may uh, be able to answer them or uh, I will uh, ask Daniel if yeah, no one has an answer. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, so sorry, it seems like my mouse is having some trouble actually clicking. Um, so hope you don't mind, I'll just be doing it in non-presentation mode. Um, so thank you, I'll be talking about rewriting structured co-spans and hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll understand what all of these words mean. Uh, so just to give you a quick outline of you know, the four stages of this talk. First, I want to spend a little time motivating what I'll talk about. Then I'm going to talk about what structured co-spans actually are. So John mentioned them earlier, but I'll, you know, bring them up again to refresh your memories. Uh, and then I want to get into the rewriting of structured co-spans. And finally, I'll end with like a use case uh, where we introduce uh, inductive rewriting. Okay, so first a bit of motivation. Um, I guess one thing I should do is orient everyone to these two words that are kind of being thrown around liberally, at least in this talk. Uh, so the first one, uh, if you haven't drinking the Kool-Aid yet, um, this is for you. Uh, so essentially what I mean by compositionality is that when a system's behavior can kind of be determined by understanding the behavior of all its uh, parts of the system and the glue that is like how these parts are connected together to form the overall system. And then by rewriting, what I mean is a syntactic formalism for making substitutions. For instance, if you're like programming, let's say a calculator, you might use rewriting to substitute the string one plus one for the string two, right? So it's just this sort of syntactic formalism. Okay, and so back to the motivation, there's this grand ambition, this is quite grand, uh, to create a general mathematical theory for systems uh, and of course, some of us are thinking more about compositional systems are quite a bit more tractable. And there's a bunch of people uh, in this community that are sort of like nibbling off this grand ambition uh, coming at it from different angles. And so my angle is pretty much described here. So the first part of a goal is to create a syntax for compositional systems, which go by the name of structured co-spans. And these are introduced by Baez and Courser. And then where I come in is to, onto these uh, structured co-spans, introduce this formalism of rewriting. And so what I want to do is combine these two perspectives on systems. Uh, one, compositional systems require composing systems together. So if you're, you know, a category theorist, birth or salt, you'll automatically think, oh, arrows of a category. So in one sense, we want to think of systems as the arrows of some category. But also what I want to do is to introduce this rewriting formalism. And to do that, we're going to borrow from the theory of adhesive categories, which is kind of like the largest, most general axiomatization of the theory of rewriting. Um, but a subclass of categories to the adhesive categories are topoi. So every topos is adhesive. And so really I'll be restricting my attention to topoi. And for this reason, I also want to make systems the objects of some topos. Okay, so I have these, the sort of superposition of systems being two different things at the same time. I want them to both be arrows and objects. And so uh, this sort of leads me to think, oh, hey, let's use double categories. Seems to be a natural thing to think about. Okay, so that's the motivation. So now I want to bring up structured co-spans. So these structured co-spans are modeling compositional systems. And so, like I said on my last slide, there's these two lives that structured co-spans are living. One is arrows and one is objects. And so here I'll talk first about structured co-spans is arrows. Uh, and so the way to interpret a structured co-span is simply a co-span uh, with these components. And so we're gonna think of the feet as the of the co-span as the sort of interface, so the inputs and the outputs, and the apex of this co-span as some sort of system. And then these arrows just sort of select which parts of the system can serve as the inputs and the outputs. And so to actually make this formal, 
we need to uh, have some starting data. And so my starting data is going to be in a junction between topoi. So again, we can offer an interpretation for each of these parts of this junction. So I'm going to think of A as having objects uh, as my interface types. X, I'm going to think of as a topos whose objects are my system types. And then L is going to sort of allow me to have the interface types from A communicate with the system types. And then R is going to take a system and return its maximal interface. And so given this starting data, a structured co-span is just a co-span inside of X that looks like uh, this right here. Okay. Um, so just to give you an example, uh, open graphs is a nicely, uh, is nicely discussed using uh, structured co-spans. And so here we have this adjunction between sets and graphs where L sends a set to the edgeless graph on that set, then R forgets any edges. And then here's an example of a structured co-span down, down below. And you can see that uh, we have this set of three inputs and two outputs. And basically what these arrows are doing is they're just selecting which nodes of this graph in the middle can serve as inputs and outputs. Okay. Um, and so by and Courser, they cooked up a category of these things where the objects of this category are those of A, that is the interface types, and the arrows are the structured co-spans. And composition, of course, is using push-up. Um, now, when they initially uh, defined these, they didn't have exactly this setup because they weren't thinking about rewriting. I am thinking about rewriting, so that's why uh, I've made a few modifications to, to their setup. Okay, so that's structured co-spans is arrows, but they also need to be objects if we want to talk about rewriting, right? Why? Well, because the mechanisms of rewriting theory are designed for objects of a category, not arrows. And so we can define this new category of L structured co-spans. And so the objects now are these structured co-spans and the arrows are kind of the obvious thing, right? They're these triples that fit into these commuting diagrams. Now, the mechanisms of rewriting aren't designed for objects of any old category, but specifically for a topos. Um, actually, if I'm being honest, really adhesive category, but again, I'm restricting my attention to uh, topoi. And so this category turns out is in fact a topos. Um, and so this allows us to think about rewriting uh, structured co-spans. Uh, so I brought up this word rewriting a number of times now. And so I should probably tell you a little bit about how the formalism works. There's a number of formalisms uh, in rewriting. Uh, I'll specifically be talking about double push out rewriting. Um, and I guess I'll start off with an example. Uh, so suppose that we wanted to model the internet with graphs and we would take the nodes of the graph to represent websites and the edges of this graph to represent links between websites. But perhaps for the purpose of our modeling, we don't want to include self-linking websites, which would be uh, like little loops on the nodes because perhaps we we're going to do some sort of combinatorial analysis and uh, having these loops would add uh, a crazy amount of, of paths if we were trying to, you know, count different paths. Uh, so there's, I don't know, it makes sense that you would want to omit these loops. And so rewriting can do this for us. Um, and so up top here, we see the presentation of a rewrite rule. And the way that we read this is that it's a span in some category. So this has nothing to do with structured co-spans right now. This is just purely rewriting. Um, and so how you read this span as a rewrite rule is you look at the leftmost object and that's the thing you want to substitute for, or that, that, that's the thing you want to like remove. And the thing on the right is the thing that you want to substitute in its place. And then what's in the middle is just sort of what's fixed as a rewriting happens. Um, and then to actually apply a rewrite rule, well, we concoct what's called a double push-out diagram. Uh, and so here's an example of that, uh, where we take a rule, which would sit on top of one of these double push-out diagrams, and we would identify a copy 
of the thing we're trying to substitute for in some other object. Right, this is often called like a matching arrow or a matching morphism or something like this. Um, and then if, so once you have this matching arrow, if you can then complete the diagram with objects and arrows so that you have two squares, both of which are pushouts, then you have successfully applied the rule. Um, and then the successful application of the rule results in us rewriting this lower left graph into the lower right graph. And then this double requiring the pushouts ensures everything happens in a coherent way. For example, like you're not removing a node, but leaving edges anchored uh, to that node that's been removed. Right? So it makes sure that everything is kosher. Okay, so that's the idea of rewriting. Um, and so this double pushout rewriting was axiomatized using adhesive categories. I've said this you know, a few times now, of which Topoi are an example. Uh, and the idea is that as long as you have an adhesive category, then you have all the properties you want to have a good rewriting theory. But that's a whole other discussion. Um, and so in general, now, a rewrite rule is a span with monic legs. And we'll um, imagine the span living inside of some topos, where we interpret the L as the object that we want to uh, substitute for and the R as the object we want to put in its place, right? And so then the kind of thing that we would want to study is called a grammar, where a grammar is a pair, X comma P, where X we're going to think of as a topos whose objects are uh, like some sort of closed system types. And P is a set of rewrite rules, the kind of thing, kind of substitutions we want to be able to make. So then how do we study this grammar? Well, what we can do is collect all of the derived rewrite rules. So what is a derived rewrite rule? Well, an example would be, if I just go back two slides, would be this thing on the bottom. Um, but in general, it's um, a derived rewrite rule is a double pushout diagram in your topos so that the top is one of the rewrite rules that belong to P. And then the bottom, uh, a priori, there's no need for the bottom to actually legs be monic, but it turns out that they are because pushouts preserve monic and topoid. So uh, it winds up being a sort of derived rewrite rule, which is behaves just like a rewrite rule that we can now use to derive new rewrite rules. And the way to interpret this is that G is some object that can now be rewritten into H via application of this rule uh, from L to R. So now the semantics of this is this relation, what's called a rewrite relation. So the idea here is we start by making a relation where you can relate G to H if we can rewrite it in one step. That is like if there's a derived rewrite rule going from G to H, but we're not interested in rewrite rules that only uh, occur in one step. We wanna be able to see like what sort of thing can we rewrite an object into uh, applying potentially many rewrite rules? And so we take the transitive and reflexive closure of this, and then we get uh, what's called the rewrite relation. And what this means uh, is that G, some object G can be rewritten into another object H by applying some sequence. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's rewriting by itself, but I want to get structured cospans into the mix. Uh, and so this introduces the added difficulty of compositionality that we need to consider. Uh, and so fortunately, our category of structured cospans, where they're considered as objects, are, is in fact a topos. So we can do rewriting on structured cospans. And we define a rewrite rule to be a commuting diagram that looks like this. So what is this? Well, we still have the span. The span is oriented vertically. Uh, so that's like the rewrite rule. And the cospan part, the structured cospan is oriented horizontally. Uh, and basically how you would read this is that the, st the structured cospan, which again, you can think of as some sort of open system uh, on the top of this square can be rewritten into the structured cospan on the bottom. And you can see that we require the spans to still have monic legs, at least, uh, on the systems themselves, but then on the interfaces, these outside vertical arrows, 
we require uh, isomorphisms, which basically is saying that we don't want the interfaces to change uh, along a rewrite. Okay. Um, and so we can take this and build a double category of rewrites. And so again, we're going to start with this adjunction that I mentioned earlier. We do want our left adjoint to preserve pullbacks. Then we get this uh, actually better than a double category, symmetric monoidal double category, whose objects are from A, that is the interface types. The vertical arrows are kind of boring, but they're invertible legged spans in A, but maybe they're not boring um, after seeing some of the talks the other day. Um, horizontal arrows are where our structured co-spans live. And so uh, then we have the squares, which are all possible rewrites of structured co-spans. So grammars aren't getting into the mix here, they'll come in later. But here, are this, here's the square down here. And then you can notice that if we put two squares side by side, essentially what that's doing is saying that we're re rewriting uh, the part of a composite system in like two different places simultaneously. Or you can stack these squares on top of each other. And that's just like um, applying two different rewrite rules. Okay. Um, so we get this nice double category. Um, and so that's kind of like a universe you can, you can play around with rewriting. Now for an actual use case of this, uh, I want to bring up inductive rewriting. So I'll just give you a, a brief background of inductive rewriting. Um, the idea that I'm trying to bring forward here is that through rewriting open systems, we can introduce this idea of inductive rewriting for closed systems. So what do I mean by inductive rewriting? Uh, well, think of it, you can think of it like this. Um, so let S be some closed system, and then we're going to decompose this into some basic open subsystems. Uh, and then we can characterize all possible rewritings of S. Uh, this, of course, is relative to some uh, set grammar. But we can characterize all possible rewritings uh, simply by understanding the rewritings of the basic open subsystems. So it's kind of like a structural induction uh, thing, as opposed to looking at the rewrite relation. Just, just another minute or two, okay? Okay. Um, so then the basic, all right, so these basic open subsystems come from a grammar. And the idea here is that uh, this grammar um, X consists of like closed systems and P the ways that we can uh, rewrite these closed systems. But these are just closed subsystems. So we want to equip them with, uh, what are they called? Uh, inputs and outputs. That's what we do with this adjunction. And then from here, um, let me skip over ahead a few slides. So then what we can do is associate to like some starting grammar, right? Again, closed subsystems, and then we equip X with interfaces. And you can build this new grammar, which basically removing all of the, if we think in the open graphs term, we make like discretizing this uh, middle part of the rewrite rule, right? So let me give you a, this picture is a little bit more clear. So for example, the discrete underlying grammar, we would take a rewrite rule like this, and remove all of the edges um, from the middle part of the rewrite rule. Okay, um, so now I can kind of fly through these last few slides just to give you the characterization results. Uh, so one thing is that if we have a grammar on closed systems and we have its discrete grammar, then these are equally as expressive. All right, so the way you're writing relation for the, both of them are the same. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, also, when we specifically talk about grammars where our topos is a structured co-spans, well, we can uh, functorally assign uh, its semantics, call this language, as a double category. So this is very similar to the double category I mentioned earlier, uh, except instead of all possible rewrites, the rewrites are generated from rules derived from P, which is our initial set of rewrites, which would be, I guess, context dependent. Um, 
So then what we want to do is given an initial grammar on closed systems and some sort of way of equipping these closed systems with interfaces, we can define this new grammar, which is basically like breaking up this closed system into sub pieces um, and connecting them together, right? We're using structured cospans to do this. Um, and I won't go through the details, but we're, we build a structured cospan grammar. Um, and then this is the uh, final slide is that when we do this, we can completely characterize the rewriting relation on the closed system using the semantics of the uh, structured cospan grammar that we've constructed. Uh, and so it's essentially like we have broken down the systems in X into a bunch of subsystems that we're using structured cospans to do, do this with. Um, and then we can then talk about rewriting of structured cospans and completely uh, reconfigure the, uh, the rewriting relation for the initial grammar. And this generalizes work on inductive rewriting uh, for graphs by Guruji and Heckel. And I'll stop here. All right, thank you. Um, let's, uh, let's thank Daniel uh, silently with your uh, clapping typing. Um, we are running a little bit late, but we might have time for a question. I think uh, David Jess said he has a question. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so I, I enjoyed your talk and I enjoyed this idea of, of splitting up the rewriting rules onto open subsystems. I, I guess that question is like, uh, in, in the sense of what this would be used for is this was sort of the same data that went into John's talk is the idea to maybe try and find out which uh, which grammars could, by inductive rewriting, generate the relations which are induced by a certain semantics of one of these uh, decorated cospans or, or structured cospans um, dynamical system? So that would be um, phenomenal if that were the case. We would just have to do the work of showing that some of the things he's working with are, in fact, uh, topoid. Thanks. All right. Um, maybe time for one more quick question. All right. Well, if not, uh, thanks again, Daniel. Uh, and uh, we're all finished. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.